Now, there are lots of different variables that contribute to problems with attachment. One of those uh, uh, what had to do with oxytocin, the hormone oxytocin. So let's take a look at, at this as it relates to neurobiology of attachment. <clears throat> and, and it goes without saying that the whole issue of attachment is enormously complex, but there may be some facets of it that uh, are mediated biologically. Uh, <clears throat> and this is interesting. Uh, you take normal baby mammals, and if they get separated from their mom for 30 minutes, you can see that the, the amount of, of cortisol dumped into circulation is six times normal. And when they go back to their mom, it dramatically and rapidly drops. Uh, increased tactile stimulation, in addition to combating some of the problems we talked about before, is it increases the release of growth hormone. And uh, we're going to come back to growth hormone later on, but very importantly, in, uh, in uh, infants, in particular, or very young children, also in elders, if there's a lack of growth hormone, one uh, result is a failure to the thrive syndrome, and they start uh, dropping weight, and eventually it can kill you, okay? <clears throat> and so, uh, we'll, again, we'll look at more detail about growth hor hormone a little bit later, but this whole thing about tactile stimulation is just a, it's, it's a big deal, okay? <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell you a story of, of these two different kinds of animals. These are voles, and uh, there are two versions, and one is the prairie vole, and one is the mountain vole. And, and they're, they're, they're cousins. I mean, they're very similar, although they're not exactly the same, okay? And what was discovered now really a number of years ago is the behavior of these two animals, these two kinds of voles, is radically different, okay? So the, uh, the prairie vole, uh, they, they mate for life. This is really rare in, in many mammals, uh, especially uh, rodents and that sort of thing. Uh, they, they mate for life, okay, and the mother is very attentive to her babies, uh, you know, licking and grooming them, but also uh, willing to put her life on the line if threatened, that sort of thing. In contrast, the mountain bull, First off, the guys are kind of like one-night stand kind of guys. You know, they get it on with one bowl and then they're out of there, all right? And so uh, very promiscuous and certainly no attachment there. Uh, and uh, in addition, the moms are pretty lousy mothers, okay? They, they neglect their babies and so forth. So if you have, actually, I mean, think about this. You have uh, two species that are really significantly uh, close to one another. The, uh, one another uh, genetically and that sort of thing, but they have vast differences. Then that's what epidemiologists jump on and say something's going on here. And you probably know the punchline, but it turns out that the prairie vole uh, actually makes and secretes much higher levels of oxytocin, and the mountain vole actually a lot less than most rodents. Okay, so I want to show you another video, okay? Get this set up here. Ready? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> study is investigating how the mind produces those tender, passionate moments, even in rodents. But they're pretty cute in their own way. They can bite, but you have to be uh, amazed by the level of their social behavior, the fact that they will form these long-term relationships and that they are so... Uh, incredibly faithful. That by itself is remarkable. Dr. Tom Insel is fascinated by the brain of an affectionate, unassuming little creature called a prairie vole, which is one of the few mammals that mates for life. They go through a remarkable life change at the time that they mate. Thereafter, both the male and female show these profound behavioral differences. The female shows a lifelong preference for the mate that she's just spend time with. Now, the question has become that what is happening in the brain that goes with this personality change? What's taking place in the brain? To find out, Dr. Insel began to observe the dating habits of the female vole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
She checks out the first male, whom she's never met. She's not impressed. But when she reaches the other male, with whom she's mated, it's clear she's found her sweetheart. When Insel examined the vole's brains, he discovered that two substances were released when they mated, called oxytocin and vasopressin. They are neurotransmitters, the chemicals that carry messages along the neural networks. These two are made in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, which is connected to virtually every other part of the brain. The hypothalamus is the source of some of our most basic instincts, including desire. They turn on circuits that are important for reinforcement. From the animal's perspective, they want more and more of what they've just experienced. What we're calling social attachment, in some way, is the craving for being with the mate with whom they've experienced this very special neurochemical moment. Do people, too, become addicted to love? We do know that the human brain uh, has oxytocin and vasopressin. We know as well that those hormones are released with mating in humans. Does Insel think love is just biochemistry? For me, the biology in no way detracts from the romance of love. Uh, for me, the biology makes it more mysterious, more awesome, more powerful, in fact. Okay. Turn the light back on. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Oxytocin and vasopressin have peripheral effects. Sorry, here's a slide. Uh, get, meaning getting out of the central nervous system out into the body. And uh, vasopressin increases blood pressure. It's a stress hormone. And oxytocin... Uh, is necessary for uh, labor and delivery, and then also when a mother's milk lets down, in a sense, that's being activated by oxytocin. Those are things out in the body, but really different things occurring up in the brain. And the main thing is oxytocin does have a lot to do uh, you know, with uh, what is often been referred to as tend and befriend. Uh, we're talking here about uh, you know dating for life, mating for life, that sort of thing. But in addition, uh, the tend and befriend tend is to protect offsprings from harm. Uh, guys are more likely to, to run, run for cover, and mothers will put their life on the line oftentimes to, to uh, save their babies. And befriend is seen more noticeably in primates uh, where they form oftentimes really complex social networks, and monkeys and apes that have higher levels of oxytocin are just better at doing this. Now, here's something to consider, okay, this slide. Let's say, well, well the, first, the first premise is early neglect can result in these huge lifelong problems with these neurotransmitters and hormones, okay? Let's say that you've got a mom who, uh, you know, is a great mother, at least potentially. Uh, she would be destined to love her, her children and provide for them, but something bad happens, and that is she gets knocked over by a severe postpartum depression. Let's further say that her husband steps in a little bit to hold the baby, but doesn't do very much. And, you know, lots of times that's exactly what happens. Uh, so this baby does not get adequate holding, all right, and, and rocking and so forth. And let's further say that the baby is a girl. Okay, so this little baby girl then exposed to severe neglect is going to have a lifetime of affect regulation problems as well as attachment problems. So she goes on into her life and then in early adulthood she gets pregnant and gives birth to a baby and now guess what? She doesn't want to have anything to do with that baby because she is, is experiencing you know, persistent decrease availability of oxytocin. So this is, this is a, as it says on the slide, an intergenerational uh, transmission of caregiving that has nothing to do with genetics, okay? That, that makes sense? 
females have a larger repertoire of responses to stress than males. Okay. I, I, actually, I'm going to skip that slide. Okay. This one is, is important, and that is that men and women alike make, secrete, and secrete oxytocin. However, testosterone can interfere with the effects of oxytocin where estrogen actually increases or enhances the effects. So in other words, us guys, we'd like to be more, uh, you know, uh, affiliative, and we like to play a much bigger role in caring for children and so forth, but we are just biologically crippled by that pesky testosterone. And, and one more little element about this about oxytocin that is, is really quite interesting and may actually lead to some uh, significant new treatments for aut autistic spectrum disorders. Now, if you take a look at this brain, uh, there's this area right here. It's in the uh, it's in the at the bottom of the temporal lobe, and it's called the fusiform gyrus. And when uh, healthy, normal, uh, emotionally high functioning individuals, uh, if you do metabolic brain imaging and you show them pictures of human faces, especially human faces that have some kind of emotion, could be could be happiness, it could be anger, could be fear, what have you. Uh, this brain structure lights up like a Christmas tree. It's metabolically hot. However, in people who have Asperger's uh, disorder in it, or, or autism, when they're shown human faces, this particular brain structure does not become metabolically active. Now, there's a couple of, of different studies that have come out in recent years. In this particular one, what they did is they did sort of before and after metabolic brain imaging and they had people that had autistic spectrum disorders and they would show them faces and just like I said, the, the fusiform gyri did not get activated and then guess what they do? They give them oxytocin and this can be given by injection or uh, more here lately, they're using sort of a nasal spray they call it nasal infusion and wait a while and then show them faces and those brain areas now are metabolically active. And so I think it remains to be seen to what degree this is going to lead to treatments for the, the really, really horribly difficult uh, people to, to treat. And I, just, I think it would be a, a great breakthrough and a blessing if that really turns out to, to, to be clinically useful.